Good afternoon. My name is Jackie Hoyt, and I am the president of the board of the Johann Fuss Library Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to our beautiful loggia for this literary event series featuring Lindsay Major, who is also a former board president and also board member. So it's so great to have Lindsay and her husband Lee here. Lindsay is also known as one of Boca Grande's most admired and published poets and a longtime member of our community's wonderful live poet society. But today, she will not be reciting her poetry. We are thrilled she is here instead to speak about her latest literary endeavor, Lindsay Hughes Cooper, A Portrait. Lindsay has always possessed a deep love of literature. She graduated from the University of Missouri with a BA in philosophy and English literature. It is definitely not surprising that her book has garnered extensive praise from her friends in Boca Grande and her hometown of Kansas City. This afternoon, Lindsay will discuss her new book, a beautifully written, well-researched biography about her aunt and namesake. Central to the story, Lindsay Hughes Cooper was a woman ahead of her time, an educated and determined professional who worked at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art when it opened in Kansas City during the Great Depression. During World War II, she became the acting curator of the museum's highly regarded Asian art collection, a very fascinating period in our country's history. I know we're all looking forward to hearing more from Lindsay and learning about her book, but before I turn over the microphone, I have two quick housekeeping items. Please turn off your cell phones or silence them. And uh, to let you know, Lindsay has graciously offered to answer questions. So as she's speaking, write, jot down some notes. And there'll be some pencils and paper to write your notes, or your questions, I should say. And then we'll collect them in the aisles. And then lastly, um, she's agreed to sell her book and sign them for you all. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present to you Lindsay Major. Thank you very much, Jackie, for that lovely introduction. And thanks to Bobby and Julianne for all they do. And thanks to all of you for being here today. Bobby, will you give me the high sign when I've talked for 30 minutes, please? <laughs> As has been said, I never thought of writing this biography until a friend, a longtime book club friend of mine, said one day, Lindsay, your aunt is an iconic figure over at the Nelson Museum. Have you ever thought of writing a book about her? This was quite a few years after my aunt's death. And the fact is that no, I hadn't thought about it. In fact, it had never occurred to me. I knew my aunt was a special aunt. I knew that her connection with the Nelson was impressive. But I didn't know how much she meant to other people, especially people at the museum. My most vivid memory of her was that she was a terrific pianist. My friend's suggestion caused quite a bit of thought on my part. I started going through things that I had saved of my aunt's and wondering what I hadn't saved. At first, I thought about writing a book just for my family. I was going to particularly target my college-age granddaughters. I wanted to set Aunt Lindsay's story in historical context of life when she was growing up in Kansas City, and also in a global context. Thinking of young readers was why I included asides about the olden days, when radios were a new phenomenon, Phonographs were wound by hand. The Iceman still came, 
and over half the population went to the movies once a week, 25 cents for adults and 10 cents for children. Of course there were no computers and no televisions, and this is very hard for the young people to imagine. The Nelson Atkins Museum played an important role in Aunt Lindsay's life. <clears throat> I made an appointment to visit the museum's or archive. Is this too loud? No. <laughs> and there, at the archive, I found an extensive collection of her letters, research notes, lectures, photos, even diaries. Tara Laver, the archivist, had bins of documents set out for my inspection, all labeled and beautifully organized. Tara has become my good friend, as I have gone back to the archive many times. And the experience of going through those documents was a great pleasure for me. I don't know that Aunt Lindsay realized this, but every word she wrote, every memorandum, every letter, plus her journals, her diaries, all archived with meticulous care. Back in the early days of the Nelson Museum in the 1930s and 1940s, when Aunt Lindsay first worked there, phones were a luxury and long distance was expensive. The postal service, on the other hand, was quick, cheap, and very dependable. So letters were the accepted mode of communication. This was before Xerox copy machines, so all letters were typed with carbon copies. Do you remember doing that? <laughs> Aunt Lindsay was a talented writer. Her letters were eloquent, eloquent. Sometimes they were hilarious. I don't think people write letters like that anymore. Sadly, it is becoming a lost art, which is unfortunate, but the, because the letters are a powerful connection with the past. As I gathered information about what life was like for Aunt Lindsay and for other women in the 1930s and 40s, and I looked into the historical context, and then as I researched the Nelson Atkins Museum, I decided Aunt Lindsay's story had a broader appeal than just my family, and I began to think about publishing it. But I have to confess that I was having so much fun doing the research with one thread leading to another. I was taking notes, but I really wasn't writing a book. And then COVID came. The museum closed. I could no longer go over to the archive. The COVID shutdown gave me a perfect opportunity to begin the task of writing Aunt Lindsay's biography. I've had a chance on several occasions to hear the great writer David McCullough. I've never forgotten something he said about writing history. It's not what they knew, it's what they didn't know. I thought about his words when I wrote about the origins of the Nelson Atkins Museum. William Rockhill Nelson came to Kansas City at the age of 39 in 1880. There were no paved streets, and it was not a pretty town. Nelson established the Kansas City Star newspaper, which was enormously successful. Nelson was a free spirit, iron-willed, and he saw great possibilities for Kansas City. Through the pages of his newspaper, he gave enthusiastic support for improvements in the city he loved. During Nelson's lifetime, Kansas City became a beautiful city. And while this transformation took place, Nelson amassed a significant fortune. When he died in 1915, he gave a wonderful gift to his adopted hometown. He left the bulk of his estate toward the purchase of art for the Kansas City community to enjoy. 
an astonishing series of events followed Mr. Nelson's generous bequest. Within a little over 10 years of Nelson's death, his wife, his daughter, who was their only child, his son-in-law, and Nelson's attorney all died. And none had significant heirs. And all these generous people made bequests toward the establishment of an art museum in Kansas City. Added to this was the significant endowment of Mary Atkins, a former teacher who never spent a penny unnecessarily. The result was a very large accumulation of funds. Numerous trustees were involved and many decisions to be made. This was in the mid-1920s, the Roaring Twenties. The economy was booming. The trustees acted slowly and deliberated with great care. David McCullough's provocative question comes to mind. What didn't they know? What the trustees didn't know was that the extraordinary financial good times were going to end precipitously with the stock market crash in 1929 followed by the Great Depression. Because the trustees acted thoughtfully, judiciously, and ever so slowly, the actual construction of the building and the purchase of the art took place during the Great Depression. The Nelson Atkins was able to acquire great art when most institutions were not in financially in a position to compete. If the trustees had acted quickly and started the museum in the 1920s, we may have ended up with a mediocre museum in Kansas City. Construction began in July 1930. The trustees selected local architects, a local construction company, and local landscape architects. My aunt, Lindsay Hughes, like most residents of Kansas City, was watching the extraordinary building project at 45th and Rock Hill Road. Lindsay had started college as a music major at Lindenwood, a small liberal arts college. She transferred to the University of Missouri where she experienced college life during the Roaring Twenties. The flappers, the parties, the rebels during prohibition. It seemed like for most of the students, the social life was more important than the academics. Lindsay was a serious student and she felt out of sync in this party atmosphere. She was anxious, insecure, and completely overwhelmed. At this point, Lindsay made a life-changing decision to leave the Midwest and venture to California, where she knew no one and had never been. She applied and was accepted at Mills College, a small, prestigious woman's college close to San Francisco. It was there in an academically challenging atmosphere that she was exposed to the study of Chinese art, which would become a lifelong passion. After two years at Mills, Lindsay's parents asked her to return home. This was during the Great Depression. Lindsay completed her undergraduate work at the University of Missouri, graduating in 1931. 1932 was the most painful year of the Great Depression. In that year alone, 273,000 families across America were evicted from their homes. The average weekly wage for those who were employed was $16.21. It was a spectacle of national degradation People were disheartened, frightened, and wondered if it would ever end. Lindsay Hughes, a recent, recent college graduate with a major in art history and philosophy, was a woman in her early 20s with no prospects for marriage or employment in one of the most 
disastrous years of the Great Depression. And this was in an era when the world was less than receptive to working women. It had been just 10 years earlier that women in the United States had gained the right to vote. Lindsay very much wanted to get a job working at the Nelson Museum. She screwed up her courage to go to the Nelson in hopes of talking to Paul Gardner, who had been hired by the trustees to oversee all details of the development. Oh, I'm going to read you from the book. Um, this was her going over there and in her words. I worked up the nerve to approach the great bronze door on Oak Street. My relief knew no bounds when the door swung open and a young man smiled and invited me into the interior, which was vibrating with action. With no fanfare, the young man introduced me to Paul Gardner. Mr. Gardner was handsome and kindly faced, and I started breathing naturally when he invited me to step into his office. The interview was not long. He gently told me that he did not intend to hire any women. They shirk, he said. Why, Mr. Gardner, if you hire me, I will work so hard you will never want me to leave. What do you want to do in a museum, he asked. I hope I will be able to lecture someday. Do you know how to type, he asked. No, I have never done that. Well, how can you lecture when you can't even type your lecture notes? I am not hiring now. Lindsay thanked him for seeing her and said she would like to return later. She added that she would be glad to work for nothing. Mr. Gardner did not express any surprise at this, nor delight. On the other hand, he did not tell her not to return. She went home and rented a typewriter. <laughs> Over the ensuing months, Lindsay went back to the museum many times in what seemed a futile attempt for employment. The last time Lindsay applied, Mr. Gardner asked, how are you at sewing? <laughs> oh, I have made two dresses. She did not mention that she could not wear one of them. Well, be here at 9 o'clock on Monday. We will pay you $10 a week. So there she was the following Monday, arriving for her first day of work at the Nelson Museum, wearing her favorite red gabardine dress. The museum was still under construction. Mr. Gardner led her to a storage room where she was given a needle and thread and a 16th century Persian tapestry in need of repair. During the coming weeks, she was given many tasks, polishing silver, washing a chandelier, reupholstering a chair with fine French fabrics that stayed on exhibit for years. Mr. Gardner told Lindsay that she would not be included in the museum staff list. She would only be working for $10 a week as long as Mr. Gardner found chores for her. Lindsay worked hard to prove her usefulness. She felt great excitement and enthusiasm for the museum's future. Slowly, she began to feel a part of the staff. She and the entire staff were giving all their attention in preparation for opening day. Lindsay and the others were working seven days and six or seven nights a week. When the doors finally opened on December 11, 1933, Lindsay was still there, exhilarated and exhausted. It would be one of the most memorable days of her life. Over 100,000 people visited the museum that December. The Nelson Atkins received national recognition as a great museum. The Distinguished Art Journal, Art Digest, devoted an entire issue to the Nelson Atkins Museum, 
it was a glorious time for Kansas City, especially because of the contrast to the miseries of the Great Depression. One can imagine the impact this temple of art held for the people of this Midwestern city. Scarcely more than a century old, sitting on the edge of the prairie. It wasn't long after the opening that Lindsay's responsibilities changed and greatly expanded. She was relieved of the dusting, polishing, and sewing. She wrote booklets to educate the public. She became the librarian. When the gallery started radio programs, Lindsay wrote scripts and became the producer of these programs, which were often broadcast nationally. Soon, her dream came true. She was lecturing every week. She had studied rhetoric and theater in college. She wrote all of her own lectures, and they were enhanced by her spontaneous spent sense of humor. She became a sought-after lecturer at the museum, but also in venues throughout the city. During those early days, the Nelson's collection was growing. The task of collecting had started well before the opening. The trustees had engaged C.T. Liu, the renowned Chinese art dealer, and Langdon Warner, a Harvard professor and one of the earliest American experts on Asian art. They were on a quest to create a great Asian art museum in the American Midwest. Professor Warner con contacted his former pupil and protege, Lawrence Sickman, who was living in China on a fellowship. At the time, Warner described Sickman to the trustees with these words, his taste and judgment are as good as mine, and he speaks Chinese better than I. Professor Warner found Lawrence Sickman so helpful in locating quality artwork that Warner soon recommended that the trustees work directly with Sickman. Thus, a young scholar in his 20s was put in the position of acquiring thousands of art objects that would be the basic structure of one of the world's most significant collections of Asian art. Fate and, and talent coincided perfectly in the career of Lawrence Sickman. Not only did the Nelson Museum have the advantage of Lawrence Sickman's, Sickman's expertise, they also had those su substantial funds to spend on great art at fire sale prices. It has been said that during the years of the Great Depression, the Nelson Atkins Museum kept the art market alive. John Russell of the Times of London said, the Nelson's Chinese galleries are one of the finest curatorial, one of the finest single curatorial achievements in museum history. Lindsay Hughes, along with the rest of the staff, watched with fascination as acquisitions arrived at the museum. For the Asian collection, there were distinctive pieces, Han pottery, Sung paintings, ceramics, and jade. Everyone was impressed by Sigmund's judgment. He was still in China collecting, but for the museum's opening ceremonies, the trustees asked Lawrence Sigmund to come visit. On the occasion of that first visit to the museum, Lindsay knew little of his background, but assumed because of his scholarship, he must be somewhat elderly. One day as Lindsay passed the office, Mr. Gardner's sec secretary called out to her, Sickman is here. Lindsay asked what he looked like and wondered if he had a beard. She was told to go have a look. He was at the west door. When Lindsay got to the west door, as usual, many things were happening. Workmen, a delivery truck, but no distinguished elderly man from China. Lindsay asked the doorman, who nodded to the side, and I quote her in the book, I couldn't believe it. There was a young man in a trench coat with collar turned up. He looked like the rest of us, just out of college. 
He was Sikpan of China. A little later that day, Mr. Gardner asked Lindsay to take Lawrence Sickman upstairs to the Chinese galleries. Keep the young man upstairs until I send for you, were Lindsay's instructions. This first view of the Chinese galleries must have been a powerful experience for the young man who had found and purchased much of what was exhibited. For Lindsay, it was thrilling to observe him. He was enraptured with the elegance of the Asian galleries. Lindsay knew then that this young man was going to come back as curator and that she would hope to work with him when he returned to the Nelson from China. After completing his fellowship in China, Lawrence Sickman returned to the Nelson and he did indeed become curator. Shortly afterwards, Director Paul Gardner, who had not taken a vacation since he started with the Nelson, left for the summer in Europe. Lindsay spent the summer trying to be of value to Lawrence Sickman. They worked closely together over the summer, accessing and cataloging artifacts which Sickman had brought from China. At the end of the summer, when Paul Gardner returned, Mr. Sickman told him that he would be pleased if Lindsay would work with him. To her delight, it was agreed upon. The following day, Mr. Gardner made it clear to Lindsay that this arrangement for her to be Mr. Sickman's assistant did not mean she would be dropping her many other responsibilities. Lindsay worked hard fulfilling those many responsibilities. At that time, the majority of women working in museums filled the same role as they did in the home, where men were the heads of the household, while women were supporters, tidied up, kept records, and followed the lead of the men. Lindsay's expanding responsibilities were allowing her to rise within the museum culture. She loved working with Lawrence Sickman, Larry, as she called him. They became lifelong friends. Lindsay continued her education. Not only did she learn under the direction of Larry Sickman, but she also did postgraduate work with scholarships to study Asian art at Harvard and Princeton. She was a gifted writer, a compelling lecturer, a devoted student of art history, and she was becoming an authority on Asian art. Can you hear me in the back? OK. On December 7th, 1941, when many Americans were getting ready for church and thinking about Christmas a little over two weeks away, the Japanese, with overwhelming force, launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. America entered World War II. Life changed drastically for everyone in the United States and for people all over the world. At the Nelson, Lawrence Sickman and Paul Gardner both left for military service. Before Lawrence Sickman departed, he asked that Lindsay Hughes be appointed acting curator of the Asian Art Department. During those war years as acting curator, Lindsay kept the department functioning as it would under the direction of Lawrence Sickman. She continued the lectures. In 1945 alone, she delivered 150 lectures. She met with visitors and donors, supervised loans, oversaw acquisitions, and kept Lawrence Sickman up to date through their correspondence. In addition to her work at the museum, Lindsay taught appreciation of Chinese art at the university in Kansas City. She also wrote many academic articles. In 1945, she was invited to speak at the Chinese Art Society of America at their meeting at the Metropolitan Museum in, Can in New York. Lindsay was the first woman speaker to this prestigious organization. She was, in fact, one of the only women invited to attend any of their meetings. 
Lindsay's position as acting curator, curator was challenging, but also extremely rewarding. During the four years she held the position, she become, became accustomed to making decisions and having responsibilities associated with her situation. But she never doubted that when Lawrence Sickman returned, he would be, again, curator of the Asian collection. Get a little sip of water. <clears throat> when World War II ended, life changed for everyone. Ironically, World War II was the event that pulled the American economy out of the Great Depression. There was phenomenal economic growth. At the end of the war, Lawrence Sickman and Paul Gardner returned to the Nelson Museum. It is hard to know what the transition back to pre-war conditions meant to Lindsay. Having the opportunity to lead a department that comprised one of the most prominent collections of Asian art in the United States, to be a woman doing this when such responsibilities were not generally accessible to women, must have been a heady experience. What effect the change in her status may have had on Lindsay, no one can say for certain, but it could have been considerable. Lindsay took a short leave of absence to do graduate work in Chicago. When she returned, she was named Assistant Curator of Asian Art under Lawrence Sickman. A short time later, Frank Cooper proposed marriage to Lindsay. Although Frank and Lindsay had a long friendship, it was described as nothing romantic. But Lindsay accepted Frank's proposal. They had known each other for 24 years, but the marriage seems to have come as a surprise to both of them. Years later, Lindsay said she never thought she would marry a man like Frank. Perhaps it was a marriage of convenience. They were both 38 and did not plan to have children. But through the following years, they seemed a perfect match to all who knew them. Frank Cooper's family had a business in New Jersey, so Lindsay retired from the Nelson, although she worked there until noon, the day of her wedding. After Lindsay and Frank moved to the East Coast, Lindsay was offered a position at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. But she was persuaded instead to accept a position with C.T. Lou at his gallery at 57th and Madison Avenue. Lindsay had the greatest respect for Mr. Liu, who was the world's foremost dealer in Chinese art and artifacts. Lindsay had become acquainted with Mr. Liu because many works of art at the Nelson were acquired through him. Lindsay not only admired Mr. Liu's scholarship, but she felt he was the finest of gentlemen. During her work with, with C.T. Liu, Lindsay researched and cataloged the collection, communicated with clients, museums, and other dealers. She also organized art exhibitions all over the country. After three years, Lindsay retired from full-time work with Mr. Liu in order to have more time for travel. But when she was able, she continued to work with Mr. Liu part-time. Her last project with Mr. Liu was the organization of an archaic jade exhibit at the Norton Gallery of Art in West Palm Beach, Florida. Lindsay's story continued. Her two passions, art and piano, led her through many adventures, including world travel, a period of living in Iran, moving from New York to California, and ultimately back to Kansas City in the 1970s, when she became special assistant to Lawrence Sickman, who had become director of the Nelson Museum. Once again, Lindsay was on the lecture circuit, giving 49 lectures to 8,500 people in 1975, 
when the architectural finds of the People's Republic of China came to the Nelson. Only one other museum in the United States was selected for this epic exhibit, exhibit the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Lindsay was a student all her life of Asian art and art of all kinds. And she was a classically trained pianist who continued to practice her piano every day. My husband Lee and I gave Aunt Lindsay and Uncle Frank a dinner party in celebration of their 50th wedding anniversary. They were 88. Ahead of the party, I arranged several sessions with Aunt Lindsay to record some of her favorite piano pieces. I wanted each of the guests to have one of these recordings. At one, of, at one point, I remarked to Aunt Lindsay that her piano playing was exceptional, and she said, people say that to me all the time, but heck, I've been playing for 80 years. Should, shouldn't I be good by now? <laughs> In closing, I just want to say that if I can write a book, you can write a book. I challenge you to think about it, like my friend who asked me if I had thought of writing this book. You probably have a story to tell, a relative you would like to honor, the story of your family, or an adventure. The things I had saved of Aunt Lindsay's would have been gone at some point. My greatest regret is that I didn't interview her. By the time it occurred to me, it was too late. The things you have saved, the old letters, are a powerful connection to the past. We are all under pressure to move on, to build for the future, and it is easy to forget the past with the lessons it gives us about living through difficulties. For me, writing this book was a joy I am glad I was able to help myself and others not to forget, to bring back a thread that connected my aunt's story to the present. Thank you. Well, clearly, uh, the Hughes Cooper family has a very strong line of brilliant, inspirational, and very creative women. So that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few questions already. Uh, how did you publish your book? Okay, well, I have the greatest respect for publishers. But for my purpose, publishing through Amazon made the most sense. And um, when you go through public, when you publish with Amazon, you basically are the publisher. You make all the decisions about what size page you want, how big you want the margins, what font you want, what color the pages are going to be. Um, I used a formatter who was a big help to me because I could say what I wanted and they could get it into a, a a form that was acceptable on Amazon. Um, but those of you who are more tech um, trained than I am could probably do it without a formatter. Um, but I, they, the formatter said, oh, we can, we can come up with a, with a uh, cover for you. So they sent me, um, this was all done. I never talked to anybody on the phone. This was all done online. They sent me a picture, and I didn't think it was very interesting. So I dug up this picture of Aunt Lindsay that's on the cover, and I took a picture of a pillow I had of a William Morris print. I sent these things to them and suggested they might want to use a, a kind of an arts and crafts style writing. And they put it together. And I, I, I was very happy with it. So the, um, 
second part of that question you answered some things. So you, did I? You did. It was okay. good. Um, another question. Do you have any idea of Ms. Cooper's salary at the end of her career? I really don't know that. I, I, I know that she got a, a nice raise when she became the acting curator. Um, I think she w at that point she was making... I think it was, oh gosh, I, I hate to say it. I've got it in my book. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you'll have to read the book. <laughs> it really is a special book. And, and I, I said to Lindsay uh, right before this is that I'd like to organize a group of people to actually go see the Nelson. It is just looks spectacular. And it just comes alive in the book and just... The whole thing was great. I uh, think if you haven't been to Kansas City, you must come because it's a beautiful city. And people who fly over it on their way from the East Coast to the West Coast think it's some kind of a flat, uninteresting place. But it actually is, is a really beautiful city. And the Nelson Museum is the jewel. One more. How fortunate your aunt had so many diaries, records, letters, et cetera. How about you, Lindsay? Did you have any, did you personally keep diaries during your lifetime? If so, where are they? <laughs> I do keep a journal. I write about this much into it every night. And it doesn't take me more than a minute. And what I love doing is going back because it's so easy to forget what you've done the year before and the year before that. It, it, life just goes by so fast. So I, I've kept them, yes. I don't think anyone would want to read them, but they're interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're an interesting way to remember, you know, just the past. Absolutely. Any other questions? Do you have some? Oh, okay. Chrissy? You just go right ahead. Do you have a question, Chrissy? <laughs> three. There were three of us. That, that, was, that was in the 1950s. And the Chrissy asked about the trip to Europe that Aunt Lindsay and, and Uncle Frank took myself and my younger sister and my older brother. And we spent two and a half months in Europe. And we went to every important museum. And every, it was, I look back on it now with appreciation because at the time I don't think I had any concept of how much went into planning that trip and all those excursions. You know, back then, you had to do the reservations by mail. And, uh, you know, five people just traveling around and everything went like clockwork. It was remarkable. I might also tell you, as far as publishing the book, the first few copies that came out and with Amazon you it's print on demand so when you when somebody orders the book they print it right then as a result I can make a lot of changes when I see something that is a mistake and please if you have seen mistakes let me know I can make changes but in the beginning when I with friends and, and family who I knew were reading it, I said, if you find anything uh, that you think ought to be changed, let me know. Well, my daughter called me, and she said, Mom, you know that trip that you describe that Aunt Lindsay and Uncle Frank took all around the perimeter of France when they were 85? <clears throat> and I said, oh, yeah. And she said, well, you talked about how they had a lot of one-night stands. <laughs> you might want to change that. <laughs> I'm 
showed this wonderful exhibition that was just titled The Chinese Exhibition was probably because of Aunt Lindsay. But um, I think it was in the 70s. It was. And it was brilliant. And I don't know anybody, you might have seen the, the poster was called The Flying Horse. And it was absolutely exquisite. And there, it only came to two museums in the whole country. And the Nelson Atkins was one. I was look. I flew from Memphis to Kansas City just to see that exhibition. It was just fabulous. Well, yes, I think the fact that um, the Asian collection was was renowned throughout the world uh, from the Nelson Atkins. Thank you, Alice. Um, at the time, that was in 1975. China had just opened up. Nixon made his trip over there in 1972. So it was just close to the time that, that, that uh, China had opened up to the world. So this architectural finds was just remarkable. It was the entire collection, the, the entire culture of China throughout history. And um, I'm so glad you got there, Alice. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. What was the hardest part of writing your book? Well, just keeping my mind, uh, you know, just staying with it. Just like I said, if it hadn't been for COVID, I don't know that I would have had that kind of time to spend. But what I, one of the things I found to be the most helpful is that when I, I would sit down to, to write and I'd set a timer, if I thought I had three hours, I'd set the timer for three hours and I wouldn't let anything interrupt me. I wouldn't look at an email, answer a phone, nothing to interrupt me until that timer went off. And if I only had two hours, the same. Sometimes I just had one hour, but if you spend one hour really focused, you can get a lot done. Plus, when I would finish uh, a, a part of it before I would quit, I would write down where I should start next. And that, that was really helpful to me. So when you start your book, I recommend these things. Lindsay, I think that's it. Okay, so thank, thank, thank you, you everybody. Thanks very much.